Greetings, folks, and welcome to The Eclectic Humanist, Season 2, Episode 4, and Your Own Inevitable Demise, otherwise known as Book 3 of Lucretius's On the Nature of Things, in which Lucretius attempts to prove that the soul is mortal. Before he does that, however, he rhetorically throws down whatever gauntlets may have remained unthrown down after the first couple of books by effectively beginning the poem again with an invocation of another muse of sorts, except that the muse in this case is not a god or goddess at all. It goes something like this. You, who first amid such thick gloom could raise up so bright a lantern, bringing everything that's good in life to light, you I follow, glory of the Greeks, and place my feet within your very footsteps, not because I would compete with you, but for the sake of love, because I long to follow and long to emulate you. After all, why would a swallow strive with swans? How can a kid with legs that wobble catch up with the gallop of a horse? The race would be no match. As bees will sample every flower the blooming meadows hold, so in your scriptures we devour all your words of gold, golden sayings, truly, that deserve to last forever. For soon as your reason starts to preach about the way things are, to share these revelations that your godlike mind unfurled, the mind's terror scatters, and the ramparts of the world fall away, so that throughout the whole of space I see the goings-on that come to pass. The gods appear to me enthroned in all their holiness and their serenity. And where they dwell, wind never lashes them, cloud never rains, and snowfall white and crisp with biting frost never profanes. The canopy of ether over them is always bright, and unbeclouded, lavishing the laughter of its light. And there they want for nothing. Every need nature supplies, and nothing ever ruffles their peace of mind. Contrary-wise, the provinces of hell are nowhere to be seen, although the earth does not obstruct our view of everything below, and in the void beneath our feet lies open to our sight. Such revelations, and I'm seized by divine delight, I shiver, for, due to your power, nature everywhere, in every part, lies open, all her secrets are laid bare. And since I've taught what sort the rudiments of all things are, and how of their own accord they fly free in many a shape and size, driven to ceaseless motion, and how these can give rise to all things in creation, the task that follows for me here is in my verses to explain and make the nature clear of mind and spirit, and toss the dread of death out on its ear since that's what stirs the lives of mortals to such turmoil, from the very depths, and there is nothing that it does not soil with the smirch of death, no pleasure, pure and clean, it does not spoil. So, obviously, the person he's speaking to here is Epicurus, who has now clearly become his inspiration in continuing the poem. What I find interesting here, or one of the many things I find interesting here, is his choice of language. He uses the language of religion. He uses the language of reverence. He speaks of revelations. He speaks of divine things. He speaks of Epicurus's godlike mind. And it's interesting to pause here on why he's doing that, while at the same time appealing to the gods, or at least describing the gods, whom he's just described in the previous book as being nothing more than metaphors. Well, one possibility that comes to my mind is that if the gods are mental constructs, metaphors, as he has already argued that they are, that fact does not render non-existence the human capacity for reverence, for awe, or, if you like, for piety. These psychological states are present with or without the fictions of the gods, and by demonstrating them here in the absence of the gods or in the full acknowledgement that the gods are fictions, 
I think one thing Lucretius might be getting up to is actually directing the reader's attention toward a more suitable object of reverence, a more suitable object of piety, or rather suitable set of objects or pair of objects, the cosmos, that is, the great big everything, and the human, which is capable of fathoming the great big everything, at least in principle, from an Epicurean sense, from a humanist sense, really, because this is a deeply humanist gesture. This is not an act of impiety. It's rather a readjustment, a refocusing of piety and reverence toward a more worthy object or a more worthy pair of objects. Or in other words, when the gods are recognized as human constructs, as fictions, the things at which we can still wonder are not reduced. Because, of course, that wonder itself is also part of what we are. But, as I said, the principal objective of Book 3 is to describe the nature and mortality of the soul. So, I think it's to this that we should probably turn now. The soul that Lucretius describes is actually a compound structure, or a compound phenomenon. It consists of two things, which in English... Stallings has rendered as mind and spirit. Of mind, he has this to say. First of all, I say that what is called the intellect or mind, the seat of reason and the rudder to direct our lives, is part and parcel of a man, no less than feet or hands and eyes, and parts that make a living thing complete. Some hold the mind in no set region of the flesh resides, but in some essential condition of the body it abides, a state the Greeks call harmony, and they claim it is this phenomenon that animates and gives us consciousness, although the mind in no particular organ can be found. Just as we often hear a body called healthy and sound, yet healthiness is not a mere part of a healthy person. So, in no single part do they pinpoint the mind's sensation. Here is where they make a wrong turn. And their reason fails, for often, right before our eyes, we see our body ails, while on the other hand, our inner life is right as rain. Often enough, it is the opposite, the mind in pain, while the body's hale and happy. And the same thing can be said of a wretch with throbbing foot, but no aching in his head. Furthermore, when limbs surrender unto tender sleep, and the body sprawls unconscious, slumbering heavy and deep, even at that hour there is something in a still, restive and agitated, in many ways susceptible to all the stirs of joy and bootless sorrows of the heart. That is, he identifies the mind or intellect as a thing that has a definite location, the head rather than being some abstract set of relations, such as, for example, a harmony of the whole. And he's very blunt about the mind being no less physical than the foot. That is, we don't need to appeal to a different set of rules or a different set of principles to discuss the mind than we do to discuss anything else. This is simply a logical consequence of a consistent cosmos where the motion of atoms is nowhere affected by non-natural or supernatural influences, but rather simply acts according to the logic of its own nature. This also is consistent with the notion of life as an emergent property of matter, as we discussed in Book 2. Mind, in this sense as well, can be understood as an emergent phenomenon of matter. As for the other component of the soul, this is spirit. In order that you understand that spirit, for a start, likewise seats in the flesh, and the ability to feel does not come from the body's parts in harmony, consider that a body can have members shorn away, yet even when it's badly maimed, the life will often stay. But, on the other hand, when a few particles of heat scatter abroad and air leaves through the mouth, life will retreat and in a trice vacates the veins, abandoning the bones. This shows you that all particles do not share the same functions. 
nor are they equally vital to sustaining life, but rather those that are the seeds of wind and the seeds of heat take care life lingers in our flesh, therefore there is a vital breath and warmth within our body that deserts it right at death. That is, for Lucretius, the spirit is the animating substance or the animating agent. It's not active, it's that which passively sustains life, that which is present in a living body and absent in a dead body, but also still material. Now, it's worth noting, if I feel like putting on my language geek hat, are animus and anima masculine and feminine forms of the same word, and I think this is an interesting window into Lucretius's psychology, or at least to the influence that his culture has had on him. It's probably no coincidence that the active principle would be described with a masculine noun, and the passive principle involved in sustaining life, the passive component of the soul would be described with a feminine noun. I bring this up because I don't want to hold Lucretius up as someone who has transcended his culture. He hasn't. He's still embedded in his cultural narratives. He's maybe using them to tell a different story than most of his contemporaries are telling or would want to believe. But there are currents in his culture above which he does not rise, can't rise. None of us can rise completely above our own culture. Another reason I bring this up is really just as a matter of intellectual honesty. I don't want to posit Lucretius as this absolutely objective, unbiased voice or critic of other world views or an unbiased and objective proponent of his own. He has certain unspoken, I think by him even unrecognized biases in the language and thus in the argument that he makes. This is not a disparagement. Everybody has those. But, as I said, as a matter of intellectual honesty, I think it's worth acknowledging those here. That he has the animus associated particularly with the head, the reason, and the anima generalized throughout the body is, to my reading, a gendered distinction, a gendered binary within his construction of the soul. That said, it's probably time to go on to discuss the physicality of the soul as he understands it. Consider this little bit. And we learn by means of this same reasoning that the nature of the mind and that of the spirit is a physical one. For when we find that they propel the limbs and snatch the frame from sleep and change the expressions of the face and steer and govern all the range of movement in a person, it is obvious that such actions can be brought about only by means of touch. And since what touches must be material, isn't it true that mind and spirit must be physical in nature too? Besides, the spirit and flesh suffer together, it is clear, and feel in sympathy, for take the quivering blow of a spear that misses vital organs but lays bare sinew and bone, the wounded man still overtaken by a giddy swoon, underward he sinks, and all his wits at sea, while now and then he has a vague desire to struggle to his feet again. The nature of the mind is physical, as all this shows since minds afflicted by real weapons and by tangible blows. That is, he's using a similar argument for the physicality of the mind as he is for the absence of any supernatural influence in the cosmos. The mind must be physical because it directs the body, and only a physical thing can have influence on a physical thing, that is, it requires touch. If there's no means of contact, there's no possibility of influence. But he does go on to describe the nature of the particles that make up the mind, the soul, the spirit, as being particularly delicate or minute. For one thing, he says, they're very fast. Nothing is speedier than the mind. So to move so fast, they must be able to make it through those spaces without encountering much in the way of interference. Smallness helps there. But also, the body at death 
doesn't weigh any less than the body just the moment before it died. So if the soul is something that leaves the body, its particles must be so minuscule as to not be detectable by any scale to which Lucretius at least has access. Now here, this is another area where I think he's wrong in fact, but right in principle. And I think I'd like to discuss both his wrongness and his rightness, because these do bear upon questions of human nature. And as with so many of the other areas where Lucretius has turned out to be factually wrong, he would be, I think, very happy to be corrected by having better information because his epistemology is, as he says twice, observing nature's laws and looking on her face. That is, his desire is to have an explanation that is, as a modern scientist would put it, consistent with the evidence. And that sometimes is all you can have. If an explanation is not consistent with the evidence, it's wrong. If an explanation is consistent with the evidence, it might be right. But to say it's consistent with the evidence is much more modest than saying absolutely that it is right. But to return to the mind, Lucretius says that there is nothing faster than the mind. And of course, it seems to us, doesn't it, from our own observations of ourselves that the mind moves very quickly. It seems instantaneous, or at least it seems instantaneous after we've had a couple of cups of coffee. But for Lucretius, the speed of thought is unimaginably fast. And in fact, it's not that fast at all. Because, of course, the mind understood as electrochemical impulses moving through the neurons of the brain is consistent with Lucretius's assertion that the mind is material. Those are material impulses. But they also are not that fast. Impulses move through different types of neuron at different speeds. Some of them are actually quite slow. The fastest neurons in the body, and the neurons in the brain are among these, transmit their impulses at about 300 kilometers per hour. That is, if we say something is faster than the speed of thought, we're actually making a very modest claim. Thought is not that fast. And here I'd like to flag this fact because it actually also bears on questions of not just human intelligence, but artificial intelligence. Impulses moving through an electrical circuit, for example, travel at close to the speed of light. But let's just hypothetically slow things down a bit and say that they travel at a mere thousand times faster than neural impulses in the brain. That is that they travel at 300,000 miles per hour, which is 3,600 times slower than the speed of light. How would it affect your thinking if your brain or part of your brain or a component in your brain were able to process thought at 300,000 kilometers per hour? Or in other words, if you were able to think a thousand times faster than you do now. I'll let that linger and I think I'll come back to it at some point in the future and not too far in the future. I think it's a fun idea to play with. In the meantime, the notion of the mind being made of particles, which Lucretius posits simply leave the body and disperse back into the environment, which is a perfectly reasonable supposition given the observations that he is able to make. But if we understand the mind as being those impulses in the brain, then we're at a point of recognizing the mind itself as not even a thing at all. And here we bump up against what I often refer to as the problem of language. We can use the word mind as a noun, so grammatically it fills a certain function, so it looks like it's a thing. Linguistically, we treat it as a thing, but assuming the mind to be a thing introduces a number of problems that are kind of hard to get around, such, such as, for example, where does the mind go? 
Well, if we recognize the mind as not a thing, but an activity of the brain, that is, the motion of impulses through neurons, which, as I said, is consistent with the evidence, then the question of where the mind goes, the question of where consciousness goes, becomes quite nonsensical, doesn't it? In this sense, the mind is a function or a motion of the brain, in the same sense that walking is a function or a motion of my legs, and it makes no more sense to ask, when my brain stops moving, where did my mind go? than it does to ask when my legs stop moving, where did my walking go? Language here is a problem, and I think we have possibly filled far too many libraries with arguments about a thing that quite possibly isn't even a thing at all. And this is to say nothing about the number of wars we have fought over how to understand the nature of the soul and its relationship to the great big everything else. Lucretius's understanding of the soul renders all of those questions not worth dying for and not worth killing for. In fact, that's kind of his point. But to move ahead now a bit from questions of what the mind is or what the soul is to questions of character, there is this lovely passage beginning around line 306. Though education give them equal polish, still there are traces of their nature that nothing can abolish. Character flaws can't be uprooted. There always will be. One fellow who is more inclined to fall into a fury, another who by terror is more rapidly unmanned, a third who passively puts up with more than he should stand. The characters of men differ in many other respects, as well as those behaviors that their character affects, but now I cannot list the secret causes that are to blame, nor invent a slew of terms that's large enough to name the diverse shapes of atoms whence such variation came. But one thing I am certain of. So weak is any trace of inborn nature past the power of reason to erase, that there is nothing that is fundamentally at odds with living out our lives so they are worthy of the gods. And isn't that wonderful? He's, he's doing some interesting things here, isn't he? One, he is just recognizing that there's, that nobody's perfect. This is not profound. Everybody knows that. But he's also not invoking perfection as a reasonable standard by which to judge our actions. Because that's kind of a dumbass thing to do, isn't it? It's setting yourself up for failure. If you judge yourself against the perfect and consider yourself having failed if you don't measure up to it, you, you've you lost before you've even begun. So while he rhymes off numerous character flaws and admits that there are more other character flaws than he could possibly have time to rhyme off, he also recognizes that there is nothing in our nature that prevents us from living a good life. That is, we're not, we're problematic, we're born messy, but we're not born broken. There's nothing in us that is a permanent stain on our being that we ourselves can't remove. This is a deeply humanist position, as is his position on mental illness and other physical afflictions of the brain which he approaches from about line 458. In addition to all this, as we see that the flesh falls prey to horrible disease and pain that's difficult to bear, so too the mind is prone to sorrow, terror, bitter care. It follows, therefore, that the mind must also have a share in death. Indeed, the mind, when in the throes of physical pain, often wanders astray and raves delirious, insane. At other times, the mind is carried off into deep coma and sinks down into a never-ending sleep. The eyes roll back, the head nodding. It cannot hear the sound of voices, cannot recognize the people gathered round, pleading it to return to life, their faces wet with tears. And a little further on, Often before our eyes, a person suddenly is hit, as with the bolt of lightning, by an epileptic fit. 
He collapses, foaming at the mouth. He moans, his body shakes. He babbles and his sinews strain. He twists and turns and takes ragged gasps and by his writhing wears his muscles out. This is because the force of the disease, without a doubt, scrambled throughout the flesh, whips up the spirit so it breathes in heavy gasps and foams, just as the salty ocean seethes, when the waves are set to roiling by the blasts of powerful gales. The moans are squeezed out when, throughout the limbs, a pain assails the flesh, and also because the seeds of voice will tend to all come rushing out of the mouth, rolled up together in a ball, following the path their passing has made smooth before. The raving comes from mind and spirit thrown into an uproar, and from their being pulled asunder, rent and split in twain, as I have demonstrated earlier by that self-same bane. Or, further along still, and then I'll stop and discuss things a little bit, and since we realize that medicine affects and heals the mind as well as ailing flesh, this evidence reveals the living mind is mortal, since whoever wants to change the mind or any other substance has to rearrange the organization of its structure, to add to the sum, or else must take away at least some tiny morsel from the whole. But what's immortal does not suffer any new arrangement of its members, nor can it be added to. Neither can even one iota of it flow away. For anything that does, because of transformation, stray beyond the limit of itself, then from that moment on, whatever thing it might have been before is dead and gone. Therefore, the mind can sicken, or it can be affected by a drug that's proof of its mortality. As I have demonstrated before, and so the truth runs to meet false reasoning and battles it and cuts off all retreat and falsehood on the two-edged sword meets its defeat. Okay, there's all kinds of things going on here, and he addresses other mental dysfunctions or ailments elsewhere in the uh, in in the book, which I'm not going to call attention to specifically in passages, but it, it includes drunkenness and other less self-inflicted ailments. In recognizing that the mind is physical, he's necessarily recognizing that it's mortal, but also he's eliminating any superstitious judgments that could be placed upon what we would now call mental illness, isn't he? If the mind is physical and the mind gets sick, it makes no more sense to pass a moral judgment on that illness than it does to pass a moral judgment on a broken leg. And if a mind can be healed by medication, and I say this from personal experience, having lived since I was ten with chronic depression, if a mind can be healed with medication, and the person made to function better and the life improved, the notion of looking down on that person for not toughing it out and adopting a mind over matter approach to mental illness, which we would never expect of someone who had, for example, a broken leg, becomes ludicrous. But at the same time, as he says, the mere fact that the mind can be affected by physical stuff, by a blow to the head, by drugs, by alcohol, by medication, points to its being not eternal. The eternal things, as he observes, are atoms which are permanent. You can't take, or take anything away from them or add to them. The void, which is, by definition, absence, that can't be affected by anything and the cosmos itself, which is all the atoms and all the void. Everything within that is in process of change and therefore definitionally mortal. And he, of course, is working at a time when people even more than now attributed all kinds of physical things to non-physical causes, epilepsy to spirits, for example, and the list could go on and on and on. But if illness of both body and mind are attributable simply to physical causes, then what they are not attributable to is a taint on the spirit, a taint on the soul. That is simply off the table. It is gibberish. It is nonsense. 
It has no bearing on the understanding of the human being as such. But death, of course, does. And I think it's a good idea now to skip ahead a few pages, which I do hesitantly because what I want to do, of course, is just read the entire poem to you. But, as I said, skip ahead a few pages to the end, where Lucretius actually addresses the end of life. And by end, I do not mean telos, I mean terminus. He depicts, for example, a person regretting the things he is going to lose after he dies. This is just before line 900. No more happy welcome home, no waiting wife to miss you. No pitter-patter of little feet as children race to kiss you. Touching your heart with wordless tenderness, alas, no more can you provide for them. You can't keep danger from their door. Unlucky man, one dark day snatched these joys of life from you, they cry, but do not add, and all the yearning for them too. If they could see it clearly, and their words followed in kind, they'd free themselves from heavy dread and anguish of the mind. And here, I think Lucretius is getting at something that is deeply, maybe even universally human. And that is the difficulty we have in imagining a world without us in it. Or rather, to flip that around, the difficulty of imagining our own death, of imagining our own non-being. In fact, I might even go so far as to suggest that we can't imagine a world without us in it. It's actually something our minds won't do, or excuse me, our brains won't do. And here's why. Even if you imagine a million years in the future, you definitely won't still be here. But in imagining it, you are implicitly present as the onlooker of the scene. That is, we can't imagine any scene without ourself also being there, even just as a passive observer. To actually imagine a world, actively imagine a world, without any facet of us in it, is, I think, something our brains won't actually do. And this psychological impossibility, or what I think is a psychological impossibility, may well be what underlies a lot of our anxiety, a lot of the anxiety that Lucretius depicts in this image of loss. You won't have this, you won't have that, you won't have the other but forgetting to mention that because you won't be there, you also won't want it, and therefore it will not do you any harm to not have it. Because, of course, if you are not in pain, and if you are not experiencing the frustration of a desire or the loss of a desired thing, there is no suffering. But as I said, the imaginative leap is difficult to impossible to make. It's so much easier to imagine a hereafter in which we still exist. It's something we do instinctively because whenever we imagine any scene, as I said, we always imagine ourselves in it, at least as an observer. Were we able to actually imagine a world completely devoid of us? I suspect we would have a lot less anxiety about death. But that is just my own personal suspicion. But I suspect that Lucretius shares my suspicion, because in trying to give us a sense of what the world without us is like, he actually doesn't look to the future, he looks to the past. At line 830 he says, Then death is nothing to us. It concerns us not a jot, seeing as we hold the mind is mortal. And just as we did not, in time gone by, feel anxious when the Carthaginian hosts swarmed into the fray from every quarter, every coast, and the whole world, everything beneath the sweeping shore of heaven, trembled, shaken by the sickening shock of war, and when on land and sea the rule of all mankind lay in the balance, which of two empires was destined to hold sway? So, when the bond is put asunder between body and soul, the two from which we are composed into a single whole, nothing can befall us, we who shall no longer be, 
nor move our senses, no, not even if the earth and sea were confounded with one another and the sea mixed with the sky. That is, he simply looks to the past when we know we didn't exist and recognizes that the future will just be more of that when no matter how bad things got or no matter how bad things get, we ourselves will not be the least bit inconvenienced. And of course, it is that tendency to project ourselves onto the world that he addresses toward the end as well, attributing many of our horrors of post-mortem torture to projections of punishment in this life, which in many cases are bound up with having a guilty conscience. One of the examples he gives is the myth of Sisyphus, damned to forever be pushing a boulder uphill, only to see it roll down, as a metaphor for a person who has wasted his entire life seeking power or fame, only to inevitably lose it all at the end. But that Sisyphus's punishment is simply a poetic projection of that pattern of life onto eternity. So as I said, that tendency to project ourselves onto any scene that we imagine are really, I think, inability not to project ourselves, as I said, at least as an observer, leads to the consequence of these imagined horrors and these imagined losses, when, by Lucretius's argument, there will be nothing there to experience horror and there will be nothing there to experience loss. At the same time, he is actually deeply critical of the desire to live forever. In the person of nature, to whom he attributes a really lovely speech, I won't read the whole thing to you, but one of the things that his character nature says to an aging man who is beginning to genuinely fear his end is, come along, make room for others, leave with your heart light, so it must be. That is, you've had your turn, and other people need to have their turn too. And not only have you had your turn, and will someday, soon, reach the end of it, people better than you have also died. This is also part of his argument, and this is, this is lovely. We'll pick this up from about line 1030 or 1029. Yes, even he who for his legions paved a road across the great blue sea and taught them how to stride the salty main, he who held cheap the ocean's roar and with his horses trampled on the deep, robbed of light, his spirit fled, he too went to the grave. And Scipio, firebrand of war, the scourge of Carthage, gave his bones unto the earth like any slave of humble duty. Add to these the pioneers of wisdom and of beauty, and the companions of the muses, poets of renown, even Homer, the one and only who deserves the crown, even he now sleeps one sleep with all the rest. The sage Democritus, when he was warned by his advanced old age that the motions of his mind, his very memory, were fading, he himself gave his own head to death unhesitating. Even great Epicurus, once the light of life had run its course, perished, the very man whose brilliance outshone the human race, eclipsing all, just as the burning sun, risen, snuffs out all the stars. So, who are you to balk and whine at death? That is, Lucretius is condemning in no uncertain terms the sheer, ungrateful narcissism bound up in the psyche in which a life is not enough. But on the flip side, and to return to the need for consolation with which, of course, the poem began, and which the argument of the mortality of the soul is supposed to provide, I'm going to tell a bit of a personal story. And this goes back to 1988, when my father was dying of cancer in the terminal ward in Grace Hospital in Scarborough, Ontario. It's part of Toronto. I was living in Kingston at the time and would come home every weekend to spend as much time with him as I could. One weekend, I came in to see him and he was exhausted. And, well, that makes sense. When you're dying of cancer, it takes a lot of energy. 
you're not going to be at your best. But there was a little more to it than that because there was a man in the room next door who was at all hours of the night or day and I heard him screaming in terror. And I asked my dad, like, what was going on? And dad, of course, had spoken to the hospital staff and he knew what was going on. And this, this man in the room next door who knew he was dying was horrified. He was screaming and I could hear the fear in his voice, the sheer terror in this poor dying man's voice. And the reason he was terrified was that he thought he was going to hell. The fear, the, the agony that Lucretius is trying to assuage in his friend Memmius is real. And it's that fear, that agony that gives rise to the necessity for the kind of consolation that makes dying okay. And on that note, I think I'll call it a day. I hope you've enjoyed listening and I hope you found something of value. If you want to get a hold of me, of course, you can find me at eclectic.humanist at gmail.com, at echumanist on Twitter, or on Facebook at Eclectic Humanist. Next week, we'll continue with Book 4 and Lucretius's account of the senses, and thus his understanding of much of our human experience. Until then, thank you very much for listening, and as always, be kind to each other. 